control this really major problem. It's kind of hard to imagine to go back that far how tough it was to do all that work, but there was no mechanical uh, equipment back then at all. Everything was a, a handheld hoe and a, a rake and a, a scythe, and it was all tough work, back breaking, and all the women, children, kids, everybody had to be part of that process. Do you think farming would have been fun in the 19th century? Would you I have wanted so. to do it? <laughs> would you have wanted to be a 19th century uh, farmer? We, we do a little of that in our sweet corn in our gardens today, and it doesn't take long to remind you why people don't want to do it that way anymore. Another perennial problem for farmers was fertilizer. Crops need nutrients, and fertilizer is needed to restore nutrients to the soil. But the ratio of animals to land has never given farmers what they need to keep the soil in peak condition. Would you be able to grow your corn just by throwing manure all over the field? Well, there's not enough uh, manure. We, we uh, raise a lot of hogs here in our operation, and and we spread our manure out, but there, it wouldn't cover the acres. There's not enough of it to go around. And even if farmers managed to beat back the weeds and keep the soil rich in nutrients, they still face the problem of insects. People were out in the field working from, you know, dawn to dusk, and there were large families, and it was very, very hard work. What, what would happen if, even if they did all of that work and the insects came along? If the insects came along, well, Depending on the season, I mean, it would can totally ruin a crop. And it was uh, just a disaster, total disaster. Would it be a disaster for the family? Oh, total disaster for the family and the, and the people and, and the communities all in that area. The food would be very unhealthy. In the first decades of the 20th century, Progress and understanding of how chemicals worked was allowing scientists to develop solutions to these problems. Techniques for artificially creating nitrogen fertilizer allowed farmers to produce healthier and higher yielding crops. Scientists also developed chemicals to protect plants from the ravages of insects and other pests, and herbicides to keep crops healthy by eradicating weeds. Together with developments in plant genetics, these technologies have allowed farmers to increase the volume of food production many times over. And without them, even affluent parts of the world would probably have faced chronic food shortages and even famine. But in recent years, the use of technologies like chemical pesticides have met with opposition from many environmentalists and the so-called natural food movement. Organic food is food that's grown without any pesticides, uh, synthetic chemicals that are put on top of the food, sprayed on the food in the process of growing it. Do you think there's a perception that industrialized agriculture is inherently unhealthy? Is that part of the opposition? I think that is definitely a perception. I think most people think about, yeah, where is this food coming from? How is it being grown? What is happening? And what is the impact of how I'm eating now going to be for my life, my children, my grandchildren's life, and the future that's ahead of us? But are we right to worry about the health effects of chemicals used in farming? Professor Bruce Ames won the Presidential National Science Medal for his work on cancer-causing chemicals. He points out that plants have their own naturally occurring chemical pesticides, which they use in their efforts to repel predators like insects. Plants are filled with their own pesticides. Every plant has a hundred chemicals it uses to kill off the insects and the predators. All of plant evolution is chemical warfare. You eat your broccoli, you get a hundred natural pesticides. You eat your celery, you get a different hundred natural pesticides. I don't think people should worry about pesticides, natural or unnatural. If you worry anything, you'd worry about the natural ones because they're 99.99% .99 of the ones you're getting into you. Professor Ames also says that the natural chemicals contained in our food and drink are just as likely to cause cancer as synthetic chemicals. And he argues that the vast majority of carcinogens that we digest are natural and are not man-made. So we've calculated you're eating 10,000 more of nature's pesticides than synthetic pesticide residues. And of course, the hit rate for finding carcinogens is exactly the same. And when you do the numbers, the more carcinogens in one cup of coffee than pesticide residues you get in a year. Paradoxically, according to farmers like Max Smith, food can pose a far greater danger to health when crops are not 
protected. So Max, do you see a difference in your uh, soybean crop in the seeds when you use modern agricultural technology as compared to not using it at all? Today you can tell a lot of difference where we don't use any insecticides. I've got a couple of examples here if I can show you. I've got some beans here if I can get you to hold this can. And if you look at these beans, they're they're nice and round, uh, very smooth. Uh, these beans are really high quality beans right here. If we could uh, go over to another can that I have here, there's a fungi growth. They're wrinkled in here. Yes, if we had uh, sprayed these beans at the proper time, uh, these beans would look like the other beans I showed you. A lot of times I like to chew on soybeans. I can tell what the moisture is, but I would never chew on these. Uh, that's, that's completely diseased and uh, wouldn't pass inspection for anything. Advances in our understanding of plant biology have gone hand in hand with the greater mechanization of farming. The use of harvesters and tractors has led to huge improvements in agricultural productivity. Indeed, farmers like Max Smith are now even using satellites, which are accurate to within a few feet, to tell them precisely where to apply fertilizer and pesticides. With the new satellite technology, well, we can uh, tell where the highs and lows of the yields are. So you're actually using Sputniks for farming, satellites. It's really quite amazing how accurate this technology is. The satellites in the sky, we, we've got ways to coordinate that, and we've learned to apply the nutrient where it needs that, and not apply it, not waste it, where it doesn't need to be. And that's helped our lower our cost. It's uh, good for the soil, and it's good for the environment. So it's a win-win situation. In the 20th century, food production in the United States has tripled, and our lives have been transformed. In 1900, 60% of Americans worked on the farm, and life expectancy was only 45 years. Today, it's around 75, and less than 2% of the population need to work on the land. We now spend only a tiny fraction of our income on food, and we have forgotten what it's like to worry about famine and malnutrition. But what about the third world? I've come to Iowa to attend the World Food Prize, which honors the achievements of scientists who have done most to improve agricultural production in poor countries. The prize was established by Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Norman Borlaug, one of the most respected agricultural experts in the world. Dr. Borlaug's great achievement was to develop and transfer modern agricultural techniques to poor countries. This became known as the Green Revolution, and it literally saved millions of lives in regions like India. Dr. Borlaug was working in Mexico when he started to develop new varieties of wheat and other crops which he believed would grow more easily in developing countries. The result was spectacular. What was the effect of these new varieties once they got to India in terms of food production? These were tremendous increases in yield. How much? From, uh, let's say, 10 bushels to 80 bushels an acre. So they were only producing 10 bushels per acre of wheat before these varieties came. Yes. So it's a tenfold increase in yield. Yes. It's phenomenal. It's a, and this shook up everybody. Suddenly here, Pakistan is self-sufficient, and India is going in that direction fast. A green revolution seems to have happened. Dr. Scovman, Simit has played a major role in the Green Revolution. In fact, one could say that the Green Revolution started here with wheat. What was the work that was carried out here at Simit that kicked off this whole Green Revolution? Well, it was the uh, early work by uh, Dr. Norman Borlau, uh, who brought uh, several traits into uh, new wheat varieties. One trait was a gene for dwarfing the plants, making them smaller, meaning that they could uh, utilize more inputs like water, fertilizer, nitrogen. 